Good evening, guys. Welcome to Weekend Warrior Podcast. Um, I, you'll see I am flying solo at the moment. We have some technical difficulties with my co-host. He's on his in the process sorting that out. Guys, big show. We haven't done a live show in quite a while. And it is my absolute pleasure, privilege to, to have the formidable, and, and I dare say legendary, but I do think he's probably going to sign off if, if I call him that, uh, General Roland de Fries joining us live tonight. Um, General, welcome. Um, it's it's a big pleasure and a privilege for us. Uh, I, I know you took out a, uh, you've got a hectic schedule and we're going to touch on that later in the show. But welcome and thank you very much for joining us on, on Weekend Warrior. Uh, thank you so much, Rowan and Grobis. He's not, he's still AWOL at this stage. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to join your group and thank you so much for for this i must say i would like to ask you when we see each other around the bri at some stage why the hell did you press gang me into this interview <laughs> general uh, you know it's it's one of those things where we've been contemplating a while to to do a a for the lack of a better word a, a bush war series and um oh yeah the, the one and only Mr. Grobby. Hello, Grobby. <laughs> Hello, Roland. How are you? Yeah, lucky, yeah, man. Excuse me, I'm going to I see that you've got a problem. Yeah, I'm going to have a technological problem here on this side. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, so it, we, we're very fortunate to, that the show, you know, we, we've been contemplating doing a Bush War series for quite a while. We've had some, some, some figures from from that era and um there's such a huge demand for the show and uh, for, for those kinds of stories and people to come and mm -hmm. come and share their experiences and so me, me and Grobi put our heads together and we said you know what the, i suppose it's a little bit of a way that we can can share in, in in what you guys went through and yeah come and share the stories come and talk um because there's a massive demand for it so um thank you yeah it's a great pleasure you know, Rowan, when uh, when you mentioned the bush war now, um, it was part of our lives. I was a young officer, 19 years old, um, at the infantry company in, at 1 SSB Bluefontein, um, 1964. In actual fact, the war started in 1966, uh, the Battle of Ungulubash, which is uh, quite well known. Uh, Jan Breitenbach was involved in that operation. It was a joint um, South African police services and at that stage South African police and Air Force and uh, an army operation and that was really the start of the bush war and that war ended 23 years later in 1988-1989 in actual fact with Swapu on the 1st of April um, lasting for 23 years as I said and when you look at that era Really, I, I came through that era, era as a young officer starting off at 18 years old. And then uh, I was, uh, when I commanded 6-1 Mechanized Battalion Group in 1981 and 1982 with Operation Protea and later on operations such as Mirbos uh, and so on, I was 36 years old, 37 years old. It's interesting if you think of, of your ages now. Uh, and I always explain the bush war as a three-act drama. It went through very three uh, extremely specific phases. Uh, when we started off in 1966 in Southwest Africa, now called Namibia, the war was in actual fact restricted to the northern border, border region, approximately a width of 700 kilometers and a depth of 200 kilometers. Uh, the counter-revolutionary war uh, against the revolutionary forces that we fought against were in actual fact contained in those sectors which we refer to as Sector 1-0, uh, Sector 2-0, Sector 1-0 being Ovamboland uh, or Shikati as the main center and then Rundu uh, further to the uh, the east, uh, Sector 2-0, uh, the Okavangu and then of course Sector 7-0, the Kaprivi Strip and then we had seven, yes, we had seven uh, sectors, 
against the 10 military regions of uh, the Angolans. But uh, to come back to the phases of that war, the first phase lasted from 1966 to 1975, referring to operations such as Operation Savannah, which was a main incursion into uh, Angola. Uh, at that stage, we had the uh, Portuguese war being fought there against the uh, insurgent forces. Then we had the Coronation Revolution, which happened in 75. After that operation, uh, Savannah followed our incursion into Angola. I sometimes refer to that as a political debacle. And uh, that was still a counterinsurgency phase controlled by the police with the South African military in, uh, in support of uh, the, the forces in the northern border region, the operational area, the Roigebiet, as we refer to it. Um, I call that phase low intensity warfare and battles without, without frontiers. Uh, you'll remember the, the uh, mine warfare which happened in the Caprivi Strip. Um, the major insurgencies still occurred from Zambia. After the uh, takeover by the FNLA and, uh, and uh, the MPLA in Angola, the war shifted to Angola and the incursions uh, happened uh, into the sector 10, sector 20 areas from there. And after that uh, era, the South African uh, Defence Force took over. They took control of the border region. And from that era, uh, from 75, 76 until 1987, I refer to that area, the, the second act of this drama, as uh, war escalation. Uh, exercises with bloodshed. Uh, we know about all the major uh, counter uh, insurgency operations which ha which happened inside Southwest Africa and also which was taken out of uh, uh, Southwest Africa into the Angola region, into what we refer to as the area in dispute, Zangongo, Ungiva, Techemetet, Kaihundu, those areas. And uh, that's when we started with major external operations taking the fight to the enemy, and the war started escalating gradual, gradually until it uh, ended in 1987 with operations such as Modular, Rupert and Packer, and later on uh, Prone and Displace, where the high-intensity battles were fought inside Southeast Angola, and later on it shifted to Southwest Angola. And those battles, in actual fact, led to the peace treaty which was signed in New York between Angola the South, uh, and South Africa and the Cubans in your New York. That was the 22nd of December, 1988, which followed on the uh, uh, peace negotiations, which started with a uh, the, the first phase of the peace treaty and the negotiations happening at Kaloek which started on the 22nd of August. So that really is the span of the, of the, of the Bush War. Roland, take us back. You know, where did it all start for you? I mean, did you, did you when you were a young man growing up, well, firstly, where were you from? Where did you go to school? I would have touched on that briefly, but going in as a young man, you know, we had, we had, we had forced conscription, etc. Did you see yourself destined to become an officer? Did you did you have a desire to lead? Was it a natural path, or, or, or did was it a conscious decision on your side to become permanent force? Um, I went to school in Fana Bell Park. I I hated the place. I refer to it as the Black Hole of Calcutta. My mother didn't like that. I didn't want to go to school. The only thing that kept me at school was the fact that we had cadets. I wanted to leave uh, when I was in Standard A to join the, the Rhodesian forces. Uh, my mother and father stopped that uh, very brutally. They told me that they will uh, keep me in matric until my kids are big enough to bring me sandwiches to the school. So I had to make matric in 1962. And after that, I joined the army. I always wanted to join the army. Uh, I wanted to become an officer. Uh, 
I wanted my own platoon. I wanted my own unit. I never thought of becoming a general officer. So I was destined for life in the military and I was in the military for 37 years um, in operational postings and uh, training uh, positions. Um, I had the privilege of commanding units such as 6-1 Mechanized Battalion Group. At one stage, I had a stint in Rhodesia as a lieutenant colonel uh, wearing Rhodesian camouflage in 1979, uh, which was uh, a great experience in, in terms of, of learning from the Rhodesians how they conducted counterinsurgency warfare. One of the uh, extreme tactical uh, techniques which they mastered, which we mastered later on in the bush war as well, was the fire force concept. So that was a good experience. Um, I loved my two years uh, at 61 Mechanized Battalion Group. I had the privilege to do operations such as, as Operation Protea in 1981. And our uh, conscript soldiers and the junior leaders was just amazing how they took to mobile warfare and uh, the initiative uh, which uh, our young officers and NCOs thrived on was just amazing. Um, after that, I had a great, the great privilege to, to uh, be appointed as the training wing commander at the Army Battle School, later on becoming the second in command. And at my, the, my, the end of my phase at the Army Battle School, I once, had, I once again had the privilege to go back to Angola and to participate in operations such as Operation uh, Modular, in uh, 1987 and later on I was transferred to become the South African Army uh, College Commander when I was still in Angola and uh, uh, almost three years later, uh, three months later at the Army College I was appointed as the second in command of 10 division uh, with the deployment of the 50th Cuban Division in southwest Africa, uh, in in sorry, in the south southwestern part of Angola at Kaama, which was a, a major surprise for our, for our for our forces, and we became involved in extensive planning to counter that threat, which happened uh, almost overnight. Then eventually, I became the chief of joint training, and as you well know, in 1999, I retired as the deputy chief of the army. And since then, I've been involved in uh, consulting services all over Africa and the Middle East. And presently, I'm involved in a project to help our people uh, with uh, the criminal threat. Uh, and I refer to that as, uh, as community safety. Roland, Matt, uh, just, a, just a couple of questions. Um, I assume when you joined the Army in 1962, it was a much smaller uh, professional force, if I'm not uh, Can you give us a, a little bit of a description of what the army looked like? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure it, it, it changed dramatically um, uh, coming to the, uh, the early and the late 80s. Um, uh, it must have changed dramatically for you. And since you, you saw, it, you saw uh, it from the beginning yeah. to the end, yeah. It was, uh, in actual fact, a very small army, a small air force, small navy. Uh, at that stage, we didn't have the medical services as, as a particular service. Uh, I started my training at the Army Gymnasium at Fort Tracker in, in uh, 1963, 18 years old. I also became an officer at the end of that year. I never went to the military academy. I wanted to go into a training and operational position as, as soon as possible. So my ideal was never to go to the military academy but to become involved in, in military training as, as quickly as possible. So I was fortunate to become a young, of, a young officer and then to be transfer, transferred to one SSB. At that stage, uh, we came out of, uh, we, 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 we were still Dalitese and we became a conscript army after that nine months training. And then uh, later on, the uh, military service, the conscript era, sort of extended into two-year periods, at, et cetera, and the army started growing. In, in the years that I attended the military, we, uh, 
were equipped with R1 rifles for the first time, the FN uh, personal rifle. Uh, we were still wearing overalls and pattern 37 uh, webbing uh, from the Second World War era. It was during that phase in 1964 when uh, the what we refer to as the pattern uh, 64 type webbing, green webbing, became part of our arsenal. And it was only later on in 1981 that we were, were equipped with rifles such as uh, the R4 and the R5. So we came through the era of the army where we grew from a very small army uh, into a formidable army. And I think that Operation Savannah in 1975 played an immense role in, in, in that sort of transformation of our army uh, from a, a sort of a World War II era defense force into a formidable counterinsurgency uh, army with a uh, small mobile conventional contingent, which became the hardcore part of the army's Iron Fist. I can still remember in 1973 when I was at the School of Infantry, uh, we started with the concepts of mobile warfare and uh, the idea of an infantry combat vehicle uh, was uh, mutated. It. And uh, I can remember still as a young captain in 1973 that uh, I started thinking about this, these concepts and, and writing the user requirements for the Rattle Infantry Combat Vehicle uh, 2 o'clock in the morning with an HP pencil. Those were before the days of computers. <laughs> I, I actually think um, I, might, I might be mistaken. But I think one of our previous guests, Corey, uh, Corey Lewis, right? um, he was an outsider at one point testing the Rattle, uh, the, the Rattle concepts yeah. with them. So uh, no, it's it's crazy. Um, it's crazy that uh, uh, I think people underestimate how, how tough it was because everything had to be started from scratch, designed from scratch, sourced. Absolutely. Um, it must have been. I can um, remember those. Uh, yeah. I can remember those courses being pre pre presented at the Army at the uh, at the infantry school in Ochon in uh, 1973 1974 uh, we started off by using saracens the the six wheeled armor personnel carrier and of course land rovers with uh, broom handles uh, which uh, represented cannons and we started doing tutes tactical exercises with our troops by explaining the user requirements of the rattle to our students and, and then doing exercises, uh, portraying that we had, had rifles, uh, had, that we had rattles in our combat arsenal. What was interesting about the rattle is that the first proto prototypes, if I can remember correctly, came off the line at uh, Sandok Austral in 1974. And Tony Savitas and myself, uh, the training with the first prototypes in, 19, in October 1975. And uh, the first course to conscript soldiers were presented at one South African Infantry Battalion in 1976. And in 1978, the first operation with Rattles took place uh, inside Angola when Combat Group Juliet was formed. And I don't know of any other defense force where a vehicle was developed in, in such a, a small span of time and used so extensively in operations such as the Rattel Infantry Combat Vehicle. Roland, but I, I, I need to ask this. So, uh, and, and some. I see some your smile. <laughs> uh, uh, some, some research and a little birdie whispered in my ear that when all of this started, it was seen by Pretoria and, and, and the generals there as quite a foreign concept and you weren't all that popular, yet you persisted when you realized there is this gap and there is this need, but you, you were swimming against the, against the stream with, with the concept of, 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 of mobility. Yeah, you know, those interesting times. At one stage, I can remember, this is a, a little story that you triggered in my mind now. Uh, I can re remember myself and Tony Savitas and Sarge Nell 
He was a doctor at the uh, CSIR, a colonel in the part-time forces. We took a Rattle infantry combat vehicle, one of the prototypes, to the uh, army headquarters. And we parked it behind the main building. And uh, a span of colonels and, and senior officers and junior officers came out of the buildings to come and look at the Rattle. And I can specific specifically remember one colonel, I will not mention him, his name. Remember, I was a captain or major at this time, that time. And uh, we knew that we were facing the resistance of change factor. This officer uh, climbed into the rattle. He looked through the, uh, the vision blocks and the firing ports. And he said, the firing port is too low and too high. And then I knew that we were in for a difficult time. Yes, uh, we started developing the doctrine. Remember, at that stage, we were still using the doctrine from the Second World War era, where we advanced along ro ro roads, which I, which we believed was extremely stupid. This never happened in Angola. So we started developing the doctrine for mobile warfare, uh, sort of uh, from the hoof. Uh, when I was at at 6-1 Mechanized Battalion Group in 1981, we developed, just get, want to show this, this was the SOP, the Standing Operating Procedure of 6-1 Mech, which later on really became the baseline for the doctrine for mobile warfare, which we developed. And uh, I had a rumor whilst we were teaching the students at, uh, and the combat groups and brigades at the Army Battle School uh, in the era from 1983, uh, and later on, until we employed for operations in Southeast Angola with Operation Mo Modular, that uh, senior, senior officers at Army headquarters were saying that uh, we were teaching our own doctor. In actual fact, that was the emergence of uh, mobile warfare doctrine, which later be became the baseline doctrine for conventional warfare in South African Army. I felt quite proud about the fact that they said we were experimenting with new things and that later on it really became the firm doctrine of the South African Army. Do you think that being a smaller army, you know, we, we had, you know, the, the international pressure, et cetera, et cetera, um, that we were almost forced into being more creative, thinking outside the box and finding out ways to, to punch above our weight loss. And the reason why I asked that, we, we had in a previous show, we had, uh, the show will be launched, but in the future because it wasn't recorded live, but um, from the Rhodesian Army. And I see some similar aspects that the smaller armies, you know, everybody's, it's more dynamic, it's more fluid, the guys are more willing to think outside the box than the larger conventional, you know, what you would see in the, in the US or the UK. Do, do you think the time and the, and the situation that we had contributed to all of these developments happening and new ideas, new thoughts, because simply a bit a boom marker plan. No question about that. You know, General Yanni Gelder said, I'm going to use an Afrikaans saying now. He, did, uh, he, he taught us to think outside the box. And, uh, one of his dictums were uh, the concept of gevechtslis and gevechtslis. With other words, the, the tactical prowess that we needed to develop and then also the will to fight. And I believe those were some of the standing attributes that our army developed, which allowed us to be strong enough during the final battles, battles so that the politicians from both sides could uh, could negotiate for peace. I believe that there were three elements which were extremely important. The first one was tactical prowess. We were good at tactics. And then leadership, battlefield leadership down to the lowest level, initiative. We refer to that as mission command. Command initiative. initiative. And then, of course, the will to fight. I found that in our youngsters. Uh, they were extremely uh, good soldiers, and they were good at initiative. I found that naughty soldiers were your 
were your, were your good soldiers. Uh, they knew how to take chain chances. And when you look at the type of war that we fought, taking the calc calculated risk is extremely important. If you look, look at what happened with us in terms of developing our arms in industry, the, exactly the same happened there if you look at sa sanction busting. There's a beautiful story about the rattle seat. Uh, it was a copy of the leopard seat. And the leopard seat, the German leopard tank seat, was uh, infiltrated through seven countries to find its way to arms corps, which became the the seat for the for the Rattel infantry combat vehicle. So just, this just shows you how uh, initiative was was sort of almost taken for granted in the South African army, and the same happened with tactics on the ground. The gefax list in the gefax list. Uh, aspect. With other words, the development of battle skill down to the lowest level. I can remember that General Janni Gelnes, Gelnes, Gelnes taught uh, our officers the concept of jackal operations. With other words, to outthink and to outsmart your, your enemy. It's, it's very interesting um, to not only um, get it from from uh, general staff, but I must admit, because you span the whole gambit of from from when it started to what it, till uh, when it ended. Um, in your opinion, and I know this is not a this is not a super trick question, but tactically, do you think um, our, our military forces would have could have maintained um, what was happening there? Um, uh, uh, obviously not with escalation from, say, uh, Cuba and Russia and whatnot, but um, uh, tactically, uh, in my opinion, I think we did fairly well. Um, but do you think it was sustainable? Uh, you're breaking up, so the question is not clear. But if, you, if I understand you correctly, uh, I would like to refer the... Uh, to the importance of maneuver warfare vis-a-vis -vis attrition warfare which uh, the Angolan uh, conventional army applied by holding ground and holding bridges and defending uh, in brigade, brigade sized forces um, we maneuvered around them if you look at the battles which were fought in southeast Angola in 1987-88 uh, uh, it's a extremely interesting to see how successful the South African uh, forces were under those uh, dire conditions fighting against uh, 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 large forces uh, with an unfavorable uh, air situation. Uh, there were eight brigades deployed in Southeast Angola at the time and two tactical groups and the South African army only had one brigade of approximately 3,000 3, soldiers in the field, which uh, was uh, facing this formidable force, which they had to stop and turn around and, uh, and still fight successfully against them. So these uh, battles took place under very, very difficult conditions, and uh, they fought with extreme ease under these difficult condi conditions, taking heat and... and uh, African illnesses and everything into consideration, and also fatigue. And the soldiers did extremely well against these uh, amazing odds. Roland, take, take us back. So, young officer, you know, if things just started to escalate, um, you know, you had your first take us back to when you had your first command i mean surely there must have been uncertainty there must have been you know how, how do i tackle these problems um you know what were some of the things if you think back on it now that that lessons that you've learned and taken with you and 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 some of the challenges and things that you faced being a young officer in a dare say unpopular mm -hmm. war I think what was important about our army is that we were trained well and uh, 
we were developed at, for, at every phase for, for your next position. So we did a lot of training, a lot of courses, and there was a lot of officer development as well. Um, when, I, when I look at uh, leadership development in the military, I, I look at the four favorite commands. Uh, if you are fortunate, which you can uh, become involved in. The first one is a platoon where you command 35 men. And uh, I've learned this from uh, Field Marshal Bill Slim, who wrote an extremely interesting book, uh, Defeat into Victory, where you talk about the four best commands in the military. The first one is a platoon where you command 35 men. And this is something that I learned from the start during my career, when he says that is your first command. And what is important is that you must care for your men better than their mothers do and love them as much. With other words, something that I learned at that level was uh, keeping your pocketbook, having the birthdays of all your people marked down in your book, all their Num all the uh, rifle numbers, uh, foot inspections, and what the duties of a platoon commander is. The next uh, command which he refers to is the one of a unit. He says at, at last you have a full command, uh, whether it's good or bad depends on you as an officer alone. Uh, at, at least you have the opportunity to develop a unit with a life of his own, referring to Esprit de Corps, and of course, of course, the morale of that human unit. This is something that I learned at 6-1 Mechanized Battalion Group, where I commanded uh, some of the best soldiers uh, that I know of. And uh, what is important about a command is that the morale must be the, to the physical as three is to one, to one. In other words, the development of the esprit de corps of that organization is extreme, extremely important. The next command that Bill Slim talks about is that of a division. Uh, this is a large body of men. It can be from five to 15,000 people, even more. I can remember that when I commanded 7th South African Division, uh, that I, in actual fact, had 50,000 men under command. They were part-time forces, but we could uh, call them up to do an exercise at the Army Battle School, and we could muster a force of... Uh, Easy, easily up to 26,000 men. Bill Slim says that with regards to that command, every person in, in, in that division, which is a complete orchestra of war, should know you, the commander. That implies that uh, management by wandering around is an extremely important principle, which in the military we refer to as command uh, from the front. Now, I didn't become the uh, chief of the army, but the next command that Bill Slim talks about is the army commander, being the chief of the army. Uh, I learned that as the deputy chief of the army uh, in the few years that, or in the in the the time that I uh, had the privilege to to be the second in command of the army, where he said the most important function of the leader is to develop the spirit and the leadership of that organization. To my mind. That is an extremely good division of the uh, definition of the type of, of leadership functions that you find in the military. From a platoon of 35 men through to a unit of approximately 750 to 1,000 men, a division from uh, more than 5,000 men up to 50,000 men, and then, of course, an army, uh, which is a large body of men. I, I, I want to fast forward a little bit to, to the escalations, you know, of, of, of what happened over there and, and, and some of the, the battles we've been involved in. But I want to touch on, on leadership for one more second, because yesterday after me and you spoke and, and confirmed and, and, and I was, was loading the show, um, I, I came across a picture of you, um, black and white grainy picture of you sitting on some kind of vehicle looking down on 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 your men and after i started doing the, the the marketing for the show one thing that became abundantly clear to me was you were and still are highly respected and you had 
the respect of your of your office of, of your junior officers and your men and and for the lack of a better description you were well liked and thinking of i mean i've, I've got a book about um 61 mech here behind me um mobility about, conquers yeah yeah well, about, okay. about, about about lomba and um being in in command of, of a unit such as that that hey, everybody played that part but young men that's living under extreme pressure they they've seen the worst there's the constant threat of 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 of, of death um, to, to be to, to be blunt um and you know it, it's something that that surely for you as a commanding officer must have been it must have been really difficult on you and then i and i look at the picture and i think to myself how do you as a leader keep perspective because you you send men into situations knowing that there is an ultimate price that might have to be paid but you still need to manage that morale and and look after them but what is the i almost want to say how do you how did you approach it what was it something that you you planned ahead um how did you actively manage that kind of situation from a leadership perspective uh, that's a, an extremely interesting question, Rowan. Um, I still maintain that uh, a good leader uh, must develop mutual trust and understanding uh, amongst his people. By the way, you go with him into battle. You lead from the front. Uh, that's important to know when you are uh, operating at uh, a lieutenant colonel and a colonel, uh, colonel level. Uh, many of our generals went with us into operations. I can remember with Operation Daisy that General Yannick Heldnais was with me in my command vehicle, never say in, saying anything. With other words, leaving you to exercise your own command and to make your decisions. Something which was important to me as a young officer, um, I read many books and studied other officers who were successful at uh, their occupation. I learned something from uh, General Guy S. Malloy. Uh, a battalion commander who fought in Vietnam, uh, he taught me three important principles with regards to command. The first one was that uh, the mission comes first and must always be executed in the most professional manner. The mission mission comes first. The second one was that you as the commander has a major responsibility with regards to your men their lives and their well-being, their livelihood. And uh, that you must be even hard with regards to this. So the principle is that when you go into battle, you will wear your, your helmet, uh, you will take your, your tripod, tripod of your light machine gun with you, and you will wear your first field dressing. With other words, there were certain principles in terms of keeping your people alive. And the third important uh, attribute, which he told me, was that you must allow your people to make errors, but not too many. In other words, they must be allowed to generate re responsible mis mistakes. Otherwise, they will never learn. This I applied at 6-1 Mechanized Battalion by allowing my junior officers. Now, remember, they were 18, 19 years old, second lieutenants and uh, uh, junior NCOs conscript soldiers, I allowed them to participate in our deliberate planning session, sessions. With other words, in applying the joint operational planning cycle, where we went through operational uh, appreciations, intelligence appreciations, and support appreciations, my officers were part and parcel of that process. And they uh, participated in the war games, and they were allowed to say anything which contributed to the overall operational plan which uh, which was being developed and this we did during exercises as well uh, i can remember at some stages uh, arriving at 61 mech uh, or when we when we got up in the mornings at 61 mech very early in the mornings that i will assemble all my commanders and tell them listen and over command immediately to your second in commands and follow me we're going for a team building ex exercise 
to uh, the uh, number 24 in the Toshia game reserve. And then they would hum and haw and say, but we haven't given our uh, second in commands explicit instructions in terms of what must happen today. Then I would just say, climbing, we're leaving the unit. And then the second commands will take over. At some stage, I felt, uh, because I applied the principle of thinking two up and two down, that uh, all my men in my organization must be able to know what's happening uh, two levels up. And we must plan two levels down, but allow initiative to flourish. Uh, I have a very interesting story about um, if you have time, I can tell the story quickly. Yeah, go, go ahead, please. With regards to your question. Uh, we were at 6-1 MIG on a particular day preparing for uh, an operation, but it was a day we used for base maintenance and maintenance on our equipment. So it was a more casual day. All of us were in the unit, uh, busy with our, our chores, our maintenance chores. Uh, and we heard a Puma helicopter flying over us and uh you will you no i think it's better for the light to be off Henry. okay um henry is making uh the night into daylight okay <laughs> by applying artificial lighting now this this puma helicopter flew over our base and then it turned around and landed on our helicopter pad, which was close to our main entrance uh, to our operational base. And there were a few gentlemen uh, who uh, implained. I later confirmed that they were generals from the Israeli army, and they were accompanied by Colonel Nick Rutz, who was the senior staff operations officer at, uh, at Bastion. Uh, Southwest Africa Command in Vintu. And they were extremely interested when they saw the assembly of armored fighting vehicles down below. That's why they requested to land. And the senior general said to me, uh, after we were introduced, will it be possible to give us, an, give us a demonstration? Now, at 6-1 MEC, if you knew the base at Amatea, uh, all our uh, combat teams were in staging staging areas, uh, bombed up, ready to move at uh, short notice. So I said, make your selec selection. And uh, the general uh, in command of this little grouping, uh, do we still have communications? Are you still right? Com still 5-5. Five five. Ron, can you guys hear me? Robby? Okay. Yeah. I can yeah. still see you look like... Uh, as uh, good military <laughs> targets. And he selected the uh, combat, team, combat team 1 0, uh, 14 Rattle 20s with 4 Rattle 90s, uh, an assembly of uh, support uh, weapons such as 81 millimeter mortars. Uh, and he said he would like the combat team of uh, one zero to give the demonstration. That was the combat team of Captain Jan Malon, still a young officer at that stage. And um, I sent my orderly to to uh, ask Captain Jan Malon to report to me. Do we still have communications? Okay, Rowan, can you You still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Right. He halted in front of me, saluted, and I said, "Listen, Jan." Uh, we are going to give a fire uh, uh, fire demonstration, fire movement demonstration. These are Israeli generals. They're visiting the operational area, uh, marching ready within 15 minutes' time. And Jan Malon disappeared into the tent lines. And uh, a few minutes later, the troops started sauntering very casually out of the tent lines uh, with their chest boxes and their helmets and the marching order. And they started climbing onto their rattles, started uh, uh, firing up the engines. You could hear them uh, testing the radios. And exactly within 15 minutes' time, the first vehicle of the combat team started rolling out of uh, our operational base in a northerly area, in a northerly direction. Um, and they were now moving into the operational area. 
in the meantime, I had uh, requested my rattle, which had the call sign zero, to be brought forward. And uh, my little assembly got onto this vehicle. And we fell in behind the combat team headquarters of uh, combat team one zero, Jan Melan's uh, combat team. And we started rolling out in a northerly direction in an extended line uh, formation. At sorry, some stage, no, 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 the... No, sorry, just a quick question. What is what is that combat team size? What does it look like? Combat team of 14 rattles, formidable. <laughs> okay. it's a, Just imagine it's 14 combat vehicles, rattle, six-wheelers, uh, armed with 20-millimeter uh, guns, uh, interspersed with a few 90-millimeter rattles with a 90-millimeter gun, and uh, behind them followed the rattles with the uh, 81 millimeter mortars inside. So a combat team could uh, be up to uh, easily up to uh, a length of uh, five kilometers once it's uh, in extended line formation. And they were now moving steadily in a northerly direction into the direction of Angola, in actual fact, into Vamboland. Uh, at some stage, the uh, Israeli general tapped me on the shoulder and he said, can I give you a target indication? And I said, that's fine. And he said, uh, uh, 400 meters, uh, right two o'clock, enemy anti-tank not firing on your combat team. I immediately uh, used my radio, contacted Jan Milan, one zero, this is zero. And I explained to him uh, the target as indicated to me by the, the army general. No, the, the Israeli Army General. Now, we had a combat uh, drill at 6-1 MEC, which, referred, which we referred to as the Fear Hordel Axi, the Fire Belt Action. Now, as soon as I gave this quick order to the combat team, they immediately went into action, into an extended line uh, combat formation, and started with fire and maneuver. Uh, troops popped out with 60 millimeter mortars, which we fired, which they fired in the move from uh, the uh, top surface of the rattle by bringing uh, uh, tires, pieces of tire, which they uh, fixed to the rattle with a uh, blow drop with the wire. Okay. And it was all hellfire and brimstone. As they started fighting, you could, you could smell the cordite in the direction of the target. And the general tapped me on the shoulder again. He said, uh, Roland, at this stage, he was calling me Roland. I was still calling him general. He said, uh, have we lost communications? Yeah. Can you still hear me, Roland? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're still fine? Yeah, yeah. Five by five. The, uh, the general said, please make the combat team command a casualty. So once again, one zero, this zero, Jan Milan, yes, do it. You're dead. And the combat team commander uh, sort of just flagged out, dropped down into his rattle. And, but the, the mini battle, the simulation battle continued as if nothing happened. And at the end of the exercise, the uh, Israelis asked me to assemble the troops. We came together for a quick debriefing exercise. And the generals started asking the, group, the troops questions. And uh, they asked what happened after the combat team commander became a casualty. Now, there was a second lieutenant in the car with Jan Milan, who was the vehicle commander. And he said, I just took over command of the combat team at that stage. They were so well, so well rehearsed and versed in uh, combat roles that any of our young officers could take over command of the organization at any time. And uh, the generals were extremely impressed with, uh, with this maneuver. And uh, in actual fact, they complimented the troops and said they've seen many exercises in Israel with live ammunition, but never have they seen an action being uh, executed with such uh, ardor and uh, such vicious intent and such heavy power. So I was extremely proud of the forces at that stage. Now, this is how we trained at 6-1 MEC. Uh, we allowed our junior officers a lot of lat latitude. I can remember 
Uh, I had junior officers. We are still friends today, such as Ari Lichu. He lives in Caledon. Uh, he was 19 years old at that stage. And he was a platoon commander with uh, Combat Team, Team 2-0, Bravo Company. He was uh, responsible for, as I remember, and during those days, we still did navigation with prismatic compass, compasses. We didn't have GPS uh, uh, instruments at that stage. Uh, that only came later. He was responsible with his small uh, headquarters many a time to act as the navigation officer for 6-1 MEC. And they used to train on their own using light aircraft at night and during daytime in heavy bush conditions to master the art of navigation under extremely difficult bush conditions during the day and night. I, no, I, is I, that a, I must, an answer no, to your question? I just, I just want to point out something to anybody that's listening. Um, the, I, I read a book, A Battle on the Lomba, and it actually it's a night, it's a very personal account of what it, what it looks like in these combat teams and how they operate. Um, but it sounds like you guys impressed the, <laughs> the Israeli general. The, did, did you guys get any reward for, for the? Um, the good performance? <laughs> uh, I don't want to ask the question, what is that? Um, but uh, I, um, my wife, Henry, it's laughing sort of on on the side. Yes, uh, medals of, and awards were given. Uh, one of the things that I did at 6-1 MEC is, uh, you will know about the 6-1 MEC, it's called the 6-1 MEC Messi. The 6-1 the MEC dagger the operational badge the yellow badge uh, unfortunately i don't have one available to show you at this stage but uh that was a ranger training badge uh, a proficiency badge uh, that i received at uh, in taiwan during a special warfare course that i did as a young captain it was a, it was a blue badge and when i became commander of 61 mechanized battalion group i decided that that emblem uh, was a was a good baseline for the development of a proficiency badge for uh, the for our soldiers at 61 mechanized battalion and it's uh, become a proud item today and the the uh, the people the the veterans wear that with pride uh, because it was difficult for conscript soldiers really to receive rewards they were they were enormous crooks awarded for uh, soldiers for bravery and of course they received the pro patria medal and later on they received the south african medal for operations were which were performed um, outside the borders of southwest africa in places like angola crops you have a question here can i go general let's let's fast forward a little bit so you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, the second phases of the war where, you know, the the intensity escalated. Um, you know, there were frequent, more frequent battles, um, heavier losses, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're in command of, of, of 61 Mech. And, you know, surely there must have been, you know, you've, you've written this doctrine. You've, you've got this, this fighting vehicle and, you know, all eyes are on you. But how surely there must have been some moments where you thought, okay, hold on, must I rethink something? Um, is my plan actually making sense? Uh, you know, from, uh, you mentioned earlier that, that you guys had, were very dynamic in your decision making. Um, and, but there surely must have been some thoughts that, that, that you know, we need, to, we need to make adjustments, we need to, to rethink, we need to replan. Um, were there the instances that stand out for you where, where you had to kind of go back to the drawing board? Yeah, many a time. Uh, you know, we, we have our doctrine, we have our training, uh, we have our uh, basic principles, principles uh, of warfare. Uh, but, you know, battlefield situations are fluid and you learn on the hoof and you must rely on your doctrine and errors are made. Uh, but what was important was that 
uh, one must be able to learn from mistakes that you make. But in some cases, you need to make decisions, even you if you don't have all the necessary information uh, available that you require for uh, proper planning. And uh, the drill was that uh, you make decisions, you move forward, and as the situation changes, uh, you reassess your situation. Uh, Learn from the Israelis, uh, which uh, stood us in good stead. Re they refer to the concept of A deliberate planning. Uh, Roland, can I stop you? Can I stop you just there for a second? Can you please repeat that last last comment for us? I think we lost comms there for a moment. Mm. Connection issues, all of us. <laughs> Robis, welcome back. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a pity. I, would, I think we would love to ask him a lot more questions. Uh, uh, technical no, issues not, aside. Not, yeah. There I'm we go, you're my, back. I must say I'm not at my best tonight. <laughs> I would have re preferred that we speak in Afrikaans sitting around a campfire. But to come back to your previous question, uh, something that we learned from the Israelis. Now, rem remember, we learned a lot from them in those days. Uh, South Africa only had three friends uh, during the apartheid era. That was Banda and Malawi and uh, Taiwan and of course the Israelis. The rest of the world sort of accepted what we were doing uh, and they had a sort of a love-hate relationship with us. But uh, we could hold our own against all of the front line, line states and everything that they threw at us uh, north of uh, the border. To come back to the point uh, that we made just now, something that we learned from the Israeli Israelis with the concept of a change of mission. So I take Operation Protea, for example, uh, in August, September 1981, which was a major offensive and it was a large-scale operation uh, comprising two combat, uh, two combat, major combat groups, task forces. Task Force Alpha con consisted of four uh, combat groups, battle groups, and Task Force Bravo uh, of two uh, combat groups, uh, which uh, later were extended by more units uh, being allocated to them uh, during the counterinsurgency war, but Task Force Alpha was responsible for the conventional battle. Now, we had sufficient time at Omatia to do deliberate planning down to the lowest level, allowing our uh, junior officers to participate in this planning and doing full-scale exercises with live ammunition in preparation for this battle. We almost had three weeks uh, for preparation for this battle. This does not always happen. And uh, this was an ideal situation. But what the Israelis taught us were that you need to pre prepare for a battle um, in minute de detail, but that you must be able to change your mission because the battlefield is fluid. And as soon as uh, uh, the bullets start flying, the situation will change and must, you must be able to adjust uh, your ends to your means. And this is something that we did regularly by training for an, ex uh, for an exercise or for an operation and then changing the mission so that the, tu the troops knew that they must adjust, uh, they must, uh, uh, adjust accordingly. One of the aspects that we, we emphasized during training was to be able to regroup and group uh, very quickly during difficult circumstances uh, by day or night, 
by, uh, by uh, executing uh, these maneuvers uh, at short notice on, on a quick order. And then we were quite good at uh, fire uh, control and uh, uh, utilizing our maneuver forces in, con in conjunction with uh, uh, indirect fire support, uh, aircraft uh, providing uh, immediate uh, air support, and of course, also utilizing your anti-aircraft uh, guns against enemy aircraft. And this, this had to be exercised in my new detail. We had the, uh, the drill that after each operation and after each exercise, we would go into a debriefing session and debrief that operation or exercise in minute detail. And from that, we will le learn lessons and adjust our doctrine uh, and our equipment needs and training needs accordingly. This was a drill. After each operation, we would do that. And we will do that down to the lowest level. Ron, I want to... I wanna... Fast forward a little bit um, to to when the action really you really started, and then like you said, you you were a field commander. Surely there must have been one or two moments for you when you look back on it, <laughs> where, where you think quietly that yo that that was close. Now my number was almost up. Um, are you willing to share a moment like that with us? Uh, that's when you must hold your pose under, under all circumstances. Um, there were many a times that uh, when you get that coppery feel in your throat and sort of a moment where you feel aghast and that you must recall your senses, especially when you lose people, uh, that's always difficult. But uh, what I found, and uh, I don't know whether that was uh, the personal trait of commanders or because of our training was that under extremely difficult circumstances I found that the people were extremely calm and uh, almost talking to each other as we are talking now one of the dire moments that I can remember in 1977 and I have a troop well he was a troop in those days a conscript soldier uh, 18 years old, his name, and I will never forget, is Albertus Venter. He will phone me uh, uh, every Boxing Day December, because on Boxing Day in 1977 at the Tali base, we went over landmine in an old Bosfort uh, vehicle. They were with me on the vehicle, but I was thrown off the vehicle uh, for a distance of, a, of 33 meters and landed fortunately fortunately in the soft sand just next to the vehicle and uh the far we were traveling at approximately approximately 55 kilometers per, per hour stopped sort of next to me and my camp chair which was uh, in the bin behind the vehicle twirled through the air and landed next to me and i stood up i did a perfect uh, uh paratroop row that's what the troops told me later on. Sorry for this. You make you guys make me thirsty. Um, I I kept my cool, and I stood up and sat on my chair, looked at the troops on the vehicle, and said, "Just remain on the vehicle. Uh, let's just first so sort out this situation, because we had to uh, adopt an all-round uh, uh, observation position." But the first responsibility is before you get off a vehicle to make sure that there are no other mines. So in, in, in moments like that, uh, you must keep your cool. One of the dire moments that, that I can remember, uh, my gunner commander, Franz von Eden, his call sign is Golf 9, uh, phoned me about two, uh, two days ago and he said, can you remember the Qatar to Bush November 19... Uh, 87, uh, deep inside Angola. That was a specific day when our little brigade headquarters, uh, not more than 11 vehicles, uh, responsible for our own protection, were hiding in this uh, little thick forest. 
But what we didn't know that was uh, was that there was an uh, Portuguese beacon, old Portuguese beacon inside the bush, which the Russian MiG-21 used as a, a jump jump up point. Uh, that was one of the navigational beacons. We didn't know about that. And on a specific day, we saw two mix uh, sort of uh, circling above us. And we were watching them closely, and then they disappeared. And the one appeared again in the sky above us, but at a high level. We were not too perturbed about that situ situation. And then suddenly, one of the MiG-21s uh, came diving down on us. Uh, I had a very small foxhole, which I jumped into. I was sort of had to creep down to get my whole body inside this. It was a bit lazy uh, with the first round to uh, dig my uh, foxhole. But uh, after the MiG attack, I, I dug it extremely deep with the Dixie very quickly. You could just see the sand flying. But during that moment, the MiG, the MiG dived uh, down on us. Fortunately, that he was using cannon. Uh, the, uh, the cannon uh, results were obvious all around us, and you could see the little cordite uh, cloud sort of drifting down upon us uh, from up top. What was interesting about the moments at this, that among so that they will always make a joke about this. I know that uh, I'd like to mention this Dion Ferreira, who was uh, the commander of the brigade at that stage. I was his second in command at that stage. He he do, he, he dived uh, underneath his raft, and we had quite a difficult uh, task to get him out from under the axle at that stage. But there was, a, there was a lot of laughing after that. But there are dire situations where troops are extremely tired after their fighting. I can remember uh, with uh, after the Battle of the Lomba on the 3rd of October 1987, which was an extremely hard battle. Um, uh, we were involved uh, during the attack on uh, 16th Brigade on the 9th of November, which was the second turning maneuver battle that was fought uh, during major battle which was fought uh, during Operation Modula, where the troops fought for almost the whole day. Uh, I, I can remember really they lost about six to seven people on that day, which is hard on conscript soldiers. And uh, the, the mix were all were over them all day. They were fighting so hard that they didn't even know that the danger of the uh, Russian mix above them, flown by Cuban and Fopla pilots, Angolan pilots, were, were a threat at that stage. They were so busy with the fighting on the ground in the dense bush against a very difficult target. I can remember well that uh, the following night when uh, we moved with our brigade headquarters through the position of uh, for South African Infantry Battalion, which executed that attack, that uh, the troops were so tired that they were just lying uh, next to their vehicles. And as we approached them, you could smell the sweat and the tiredness and the adrenaline of those soldiers. And we dro drove right through their, their legal position with our brigade headquarters moving to the next uh, command position. And not one of those troops even woke up. That, that is how tired they were. And a day later, they were involved in the next brigade attack. I can remember that uh, there was a saying at that stage that uh, those soldiers of ours who were involved in the battle in Southeast Angola saw more battle in that short time than many veterans from the Second World War. Sure, that that's that's an eye opener. I mean, it, if you if you look at this book that we've mentioned, I mean, it's yeah, it it, it you know there's a lot of short books and stuff behind me on the shelf, but you know what you've just told us. I mean, you I think it's it's touched on briefly in in the book as well, and um, it was the first time that I read a book about the about what happened, you know, during that time where some of the harsh realities 
were set in, really set in. Um, and and I mean, and, and, and Leopold Scholz made mention of it in the, earlier in the book, where he said that it's not a pretty book. It, it's not a it's not a romantic account of what happened. Yeah. It's, it's the hard realities. And um, as much as you can put it onto paper. And um, hi, guys, if you have the opportunity, find find the book Rattles on the Lombard, Leopold Scholz. Um, and, and it colors in what, what Roland said tonight um, quite a bit. And, and I mean, it's, it's, we, we are working on something that I'll speak to you about in, sometime in the future. Yeah. But it's a, it's a fantastic book and it, and it really hits home the harsh realities. It takes away some of the romantic aspect that, that a lot of people seem to have about what, what happens over there. Roland, I, I know you're chomping at the bit to, to discuss what you're busy with at the moment, but I'm going to tackle one or two small questions from the, from the audience. And okay. Here is, a good, here is an interesting one. Um, what is your opinion on the Battle of Kasinga? Swapo is still adamant that it was a refugee camp, but based on the ZU-23 guns at Kasinga and militants, that claim that claim does not add up. Yeah, um, there's, there is an interesting conundrum about the Battle of Kasinga. Um, I was not there myself, but uh, I would like to skip that question in actual fact, and I would like to pass it to officers who were there, who did extreme, res extreme research on that, and also wrote theses on that, like Brigadier General uh, Mac Alexander. I was at Kazinga myself during a battlefield tour. I saw the mass grave. I know that there are, uh, uh, what is, uh, 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 accusations, accusations, yeah. <laughs> by, by SWAPU and by the international community. I've also spoken to officers who were there with a battle, and I would like to leave uh, that answer to them. Fair, fair enough. So before we move on to your, your current projects, there's a one question I love to ask every every person that we have on the show that comes through that area era era, sorry. Um it, it's a question that I love to ask because it, it's always interesting the answers. You know, that time there was quite a bit of propaganda. You know, not not everything that happened over there was always accurate in the burger and in the build and in the report. And um, obviously, there was media was censored quite a bit, and um, you know there was the stories and the myths and the legends, etc. So, the one thing that I that I like to ask is, taking that into account, what do you think was one of the biggest misconceptions that South Africans and then and now have or had about the enemy that we faced? Um, and, and, and I'm going to give you somebody else's answer to give you, to lead you to what, what I'm curious about. I mean, one of our previous guests, Franz van Dijk, said that there was a misconception that we were facing an untrained, um, incompetent enemy. Um, what is your opinion on that question? You know, what, what do you think is some of the largest misconceptions that, that the public have about what happened over there? Okay, I, uh, I wrote about that in I the Firestorm as well and in Mobile Warfare for Africa as well. Uh, when we look, firstly, let's look at UNITA, uh, who, who became our allies after uh, Operation so uh, Savannah in 1975. They had an extremely good guerrilla army, which fought an informal war, an unconventional war, a guerrilla war. They kept 55,000 Cubans uh, busy all over Angola and they were a guerrilla force to be reckoned with but it wasn't a conventional army although they had semi-regular battalions which we which fought well but you can't expect an uh, from an army such as UNITA a guerrilla army to be a professional military army although they used uh, hardware such as anti-tank weapons and uh, and even tanks extremely uh, they were extremely capable of handling these weapon systems uh, during battles, 
such as the ones that we fought in Southeast Angola. But they were a guerrilla army. Don't expect them to be on the start line uh, on a shower. Although my experience was during the battles that we fought in Southeast Angola that you could rely on UNITA. If you ask them to fire rockets on uh, Menongwe to uh, deter the enemy air threat, they will be there and they will do their task extremely well. If you look at the uh, counter, the revolutionary forces of SWAPU, the Southwest Africa People's Organization, and their military wing, wing uh, the People's Liberation Army of Namibia, they were insurgent fighters, they were a guerrilla army, and they were well trained, and they did their job well. We had respect for SWAPU. If you ask me about MK, um, uh, I was never involved in the internal battles. Uh, I refer to them in my book as uh, being good at planting bombs and planting mines and at throwing stones, but we never respected them, as uh, I must be honest about that, as a formidable guerrilla force. So they were there, they were uh, a deterring factor, but it was never a force to be reckoned with. When you look at the internal struggle, uh, it was well con contained by the South African uh, police forces and, uh, of course, uh, the South African army's uh, counterinsurgency uh, territorial forces supported the South African police. Uh, we never saw them uh, as a major military threat. SWAPU was a good army, as an insurgent army. UNITA fought well in Angola, but uh, we didn't really have respect for MK as, as a formidable uh, guerrilla force. You, inter you, you echo France's words almost to, to the letter. You know, his answer was there's almost, I, it's, it's almost verbatim. But let's move into your current project. I know you, you would love to have a chat about that, and, and it's exciting. Um, so tell us more about your, your community safety projects. Um, how did that come about? How did it start? Yeah, um, we're getting we're getting lots of very good feedback from other local um, mm. um, sectors that are actually employing your um, employing all the the, the, the the tactics and and preventing uh, and combating crime. Yeah, please please tell us more. Uh, it's great to hear that, Robis. Um, I hope nobody is going to ask me about the situation, the political issues which happened in our country after 94. I mean, that's a done deal. Uh, I always maintain that uh, the purpose of war is to uh, create a better form of peace. I think we really try to do, uh, try to do that with the political changes which happened in South Africa in 1994. Uh, I'm not going to become involved in any arguing about we should have done it this way or that way. Yeah, we are today. Um, it is uh, almost three decades later. We're sitting in a, an extremely messy situation. Um, the ANC is incapable of, of running this country. We see what is happening, happening at uh, local government level and you even at provincial and, and, and governmental level. We, we look at corruption in the country. We look, look at the threat of, of major crime. Now, what happened uh, with regards to the current project that I'm involved in, which I refer to as uh, community safety, Veiligheid van Gemeenschappen, is that uh, when Henrette and, in, and I spent some time in the Middle East, I received many phone calls from friends of mine and said, listen, Roland, all your experience that you had, I'm referring to operations such, uh, such as Operation Carrot Nyahu, 1981, 1982, major incursions into the Death Triangle in the farming area south of the Red Line in areas uh, uh, adjacent to Tumep, Utavi and Grootfontein. And uh, the county insurgency experiences that we gained in these types of operations we're uh, we're facing a major uh, threat once again which i refer, refer to as a fourth generation warfare threat 
uh, irregular warfare threat. If we look at farm attacks, we look at uh, the illegal trespassing uh, on land and, and land grabs, uh, taxi violence, etc., etc., etc. I can carry on with that. Looking at school incidents, incidents which occurred again uh, uh, over the last few days, um, mm. incidents which happened at the Swaziland school a few years ago, and at Overfall and uh, This is a major threat that we're facing in this country, and uh, it is clear that the ANC government does not have the will or, or the ability to contain. Uh, the criminal threat and the and the deeds of terror that we experience currently in our country, and uh, we realise that uh, the South African Police Service uh, have major problems with containing this threat as well. They just don't have the the necessary crime intelligence to contain this threat or the ability to the, to do this successfully, and uh, we see see this on a daily basis. Even private security companies cannot contain the situation. That leaves us with uh, with uh, one option, and that is for communities to take control over their situations uh, and their own safety, and to establish uh, community safety organisations uh, to in, to enable them to do this. And the major the major well the focus of main effort is. Uh, is to save lives, to to uh, make our people safe there where they are. In actual fact, I think we've passed the threshold of uh, safety for communities at at this stage, and uh, we've we've entered uh, an arena where we can start talking about self-preservation and uh, preserving the livelihood of our people. So many of my my friends. Uh, veteran soldiers, farmer friends, uh, contact me and said, listen, Roland, will you come and help us uh, with uh, the, the establishment of uh, community safety organizations so that we can empower ourselves to safeguard ourselves? Now, and you mentioned the book of, of Rattles on the Lombard just now. At some stage, uh, Dr. Leopold Scholz came to visit me at my home, uh, we were sitting here on the veranda, having uh, a braai, and uh, he was involved uh, at that stage with solidarity and Afri Forum, and he said, Roland, will you be prepared to come and help our organization to develop a uh, strategy for community safety? Uh, I was thinking about that. At that stage, I was still giving class at the Command and Staff College in Canberra, and I was on my way there. And I said, yes, I will, uh, at their request, attend a meeting and see how, what we can do about this situation. And in the process, I was explaining to them, to him, the importance of intelligence because you cannot fly, fight blind. And it's important to have intelligence about your situation, to have situa situation awareness, to understand your situation so that you can plan and become involved in uh, uh, a proactive uh, uh, mode to to uh, contain the criminal threat. So at some stage, I became involved with uh, Afri Forum, and I supported them in the development of a community safety strategy, which we refer to as Project ne Nehemiah, uh, which is interesting if you go and read the Bible, what Nehemiah did in terms of building the wall uh, with the main focus of every family building the wall in front of his own home first. This became sort of the the major thinking behind the development of the strategy. Home and hearth protection, uh, each family becoming involved in the safety concept. But uh, I later on moved on and uh, I answered the call of many of my friends and we started helping communities over weekends to develop the community safety plans, uh, establishing community safety zones in areas and developing community safety units. Over weekends, we took them through the uh, planning process, which the Israelis taught us, the joint operational planning cycle, where we start off on a Friday, on a Friday to do a proper appreciation of terrain. 
uh, determining what the influence of terrain uh, will be on uh, the criminal baseline and then you know, how terrain can be used as a neutral factor to the best of the community's ability. And then on the Saturday, we will do a proper risk assessment uh, and intelligence appreciation looking at the threat and all its dimensions, for example, farm attacks and how that materializes and what happens on the ground with regards to that and the major impact uh, of that on our people. And then, of course, we will do proper operational appreciations, assessing the capabilities that, that we require, require in any community safety unit to safeguard our people. This also implies that, uh, and we've been doing training the last week at Broncos Plate, where we train rapid deployment capabilities. We refer to them as proto teams, extremely professional training. Of course, everything we do needs to be professional and needs to be legal. It needs to be uh, linked into a legal framework, a framework. So we started off, we worked very hard the last four years, small team uh, supported me, all volunteers. Uh, it's, uh, it all comes from the heart. Uh, people help me with, uh, support me with, uh, with uh, fuel, and we 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 uh, stay with farmers on their farms, or uh, with communities, to keep the cost low because we are all volunteers. But what really materialized was a series of workshops shops that we held all over. I can remember last year from September until. Uh, September until approximately December, there were 18 weekends that I worked every weekend. I was extremely tired uh, when 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 Christmas eventually arrived, uh, taking communities through this planning exercise. I can remember at one stage that, that I was driving from Port Alfred to Aberdeen, having a work session, off to Farlots, and then to Kuruman, back to Lindequist Drift, then off to Tolva, in the Lipopo province, onto Northern, onto Rutan, just keeping on helping the communities developing the concept. And now that is taking root where communities are taking uh, ownership for their own saf safety. It's wonderful to see how this network is developing. We uh, refer to the concept taught by John J. McCune in his book, Counter Revolutionary Warfare, where he talks about oil spot tactics the establishment of strategic base areas. We refer to that as community safety zones, where you take a community such as Graf Reinet, you help develop them, uh, help them to develop their plan and to implement the, that plan, starting off with, with a leadership team of seven people, uh, expanding to 35 people. Eventually, they have a thousand people. We don't we don't chase numbers, we chase capability. But there are a thousand members all signed up in the community safety unit, and they, it has a major impact on crime. Uh, in this sense, we have, in a very informal manner, have, have started establishing community safety zones all over the country, uh, helping them to, to, to develop community safety units, even with, even with air support. So this is an ongoing process. Um, and it, it's, it's going well. And from these workshops, uh, we soon realized that it was necessary that uh, we require a doctrine for community safety. And with a small team, we started developing uh, the concepts that, that is uh, encapsulated in, in this. I refer to it as a manual. It is not a coffee table book but it can be used by any community. And in actual fact, what we do is we give the intellectual capital away. Uh, Naledi has decided to uh, distribute that book at a, at a very low cost. The price of the book is uh, 209 pounds. And uh, there's no, there's no uh, uh, money in this for the authors. We said that in actual we would like to give the uh, intellectual capital, which is contained oh, in this book, oh, await oh, our yes. people Roland, as quickly as possible. Roland, Roland, let me just stop you there for a quick second. We lost comms there for about 10 seconds. Can you just repeat your, your last paragraph? Okay, what I said, uh, Rowan, is that 
all the information that you require for a community to empower themselves uh, for their own protection is contained in this manual. And that we in actual fact want to give the intellectual capital away for our people to take ownership of this. In actual fact, we would like to see them further develop the concepts. Um, there's everything in that book that you need, as well as practical things such as immediate action roles, you know, uh, hints for, for, uh, for community safety. Uh, everything is con contained in that, in that book. Roland, how do, how do people get, get the book? They can uh, buy it from Naledi. Uh, I can provide the number for you uh, that they can phone. And uh, the book is then, uh, it's also in the bookshops. Uh, the book will be sent to you. Uh, and the amount to 95 rands contain postage as well. So okay, the drill really yeah. is for a community when they decide uh, to establish an organization uh, to safeguard themselves, that they will start off by uh, by putting a small uh, guiding coalition, a leadership team together, who takes ownership for that, and then we will help them to uh, to do their planning, and then they will implement uh, the plan. Uh, about two weeks, two weekends ago. Uh, Kauham municipality came to me and said that they would develop, uh, this is the Jeffreys Bay, Himansdorp, Patensi, Babian, Thornhill area, that they would like to uh, use the knowledge that we have acquired over the last four years to develop a comprehensive community safety plan for the municipality. Now, this was an interesting exercise because the mayoral committee and the mayor as such took full responsibility. This is uh, truly his, uh, his passion, Horatio Hendricks, uh, to, take responsibility, respons to take responsibility for the safety of his, of his community. And the actual fact, what was very interesting is that the mayoral committee is responsible to provide strategic direction for this whole process. And... Uh, to uh, engender the necessary support for community safety. And that they are going to establish a regional office uh, at Iman's door to take uh, responsibility for the operational level planning. And uh, they are going to st uh, establish an air support unit and an operation center, which will integrate all the necessary camera as assets. And of course, the uh, the telecommunications that go with that, which is part and parcel of a proper command and control system. But we are also developing uh, five uh, community safety units. The one is based on Jeffrey's Bay, Bay itself, the other one on Himansdorp, and of course the corridor on the way to Cape St. Francis, that's the next unit, which we refer to as uh, com Community Safety Unit 2.0. Of course, there is Hamtuas, the Hamtuas Valley, which includes Patensi and Hanke, Thornhill, uh, Crossways, Babian, that area, it's quite a large area. And then uh, Oyster Bay itself will establish a community safety unit. And then Tsitsikama, Storms River, and Kariado said that they would like to be included in this exercise as well. So we're in actual fact uh, establishing a complete system at the strategic, operational, and the tactical level, which is a is a new innovation with regards to the community safety project that we are busy with. Um, I know that on the 29th of April and 29th, 30th of April, we're taking the units units through a proper tactical uh, exercise to develop their tactical plans. So this this is just one example of what's happening. Uh, when we talk about oil spot tactics, which we learned from John J. McEwen's book, The Art of Counter-Revolutionary Warfare, I always use the example, if you drop a piece of oil on uh, on a piece of brown paper, what happens to the oil spot? It expands automatically. So, sort of informally, uh, as if by magic, we are developing uh, a spider web across South Africa, uh, 
and a network and a network of of leaders who are who are becoming involved in community safety. The example that we have from fallouts for as an example, specific example, is uh, Johan Stolz and Gerd Krier who phoned me. And uh, I visited them on the 18th of October just uh, to, to sort of explain the concept. Uh, and we came together in a, a little church hall in Machogong, close to Arzwater, on the 18th of October 19, uh, 2019. We started off with a group of 35 people. We were back in February with 150 people in the same little hall. We did, we, we did a proper operational planning cycle to develop their plan. It is two years hence. They have enrolled more than uh, 1,000 people. All the uh, uh, agricultural organizations are involved. They have established a proper operation center uh, on a farm in Machagong. They are working very closely with the South African Police Service and with crime intelligence. They are extremely successful at that. And uh, during these developments, uh, uh, back again to the oil spot concept, uh, Revulu came to us and they said they wanted to do the same. And we did the same. And then Ulia, it is another adjacent uh, community safety group, came to us and they said they would like to be subjected to the same type of, uh, of uh, planning exercise. We did that with them. And then Schweizer Reineke come to the, came to the fore. And at this stage, uh, Postmas Burg is interested to become involved. Kuruman is already involved. And the area uh, in the dunes to the north of the Olifants Uli, Hook, uh, Uppington Road, that farmer community said they would like to become involved in this process as well. So soon after that exercise with the South African police, we went through a proper planning exercise to develop a contingency plan plan for farm attacks in that area, uh, utilizing two extremely important uh, principles. And that was that the whole area uh, must be, we must be able to isolate that whole area within 10 to 20 minutes. And they can do that. And that any crisis point must be reached within 12 to 20 minutes and we've written the exercise uh, COVID-19 interfered with the, with the proceedings but we are going to have an exercise to exercise excuse me to exercise this whole concept and this is on the cards uh, in uh, the near future so there's a lot of work uh, to be done and there's a lot of work that has been done but it is quite clear to me that we have the leadership on the ground that uh, can take ownership for the protection of their people. And uh, we have found that in most cases that we can work well with other role players and interest groups such as the South African Police Services and, of course, civil, uh, civil rights organizations such as Afri Forum and uh, uh, organized uh, agriculture. Organizations such as Agri SA, uh, Transvaal, Lampo Ini and uh, other similar organizations and uh, agricultural unions we find all over the place. I just find that when people start focusing on the safety of their people and they leave the agendas of organizations uh, on the outside, uh, that things start working well. Yeah, it's um, some, some outside. Some outside commentators would say South Africa is in a low, low scale, low intensity civil war at the moment, and um, I think um, these uh, um, the objectives and the the planning and the implementation of these uh, community safety projects is, is is super important. Yeah, well done on that. Yeah. And yeah, no, uh, like we, us, we must we've, we've we got, must take we've control good, of our uh, sorry. I so say no, we no, must no, take no. control over our own safety situations. I always ask the question in groups. If we look at, uh, you were re referring to low intensity war, but if you look at revolution, revolutionary war and counter revolutionary war, what's happening in Mozamb Mozambique currently? Boko Haram. If you look at the Middle East, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and the likes of them, 
and how they operate. And you look at our country and uh, we look at the lessons that we learned during the South African border war and the phases of revolutionary warfare. You know, it's we can answer the question to ourselves. Um, if you look at the phases of, of revolutionary war, war and counter-revolutionary war, the first phase is the mobilization phase, uh, where the forces start organizing themselves. You look at student movements, farmer movements, and the likes, and they start preparing their forces. And then the second phase, which we refer, refer to as uh, the terrorism phase, and uh, how that manifests, manifests on the ground. And then that develops into full-scale guerrilla warfare. And eventually, eventually, during the fourth phase, into full anarchy, which could even uh, uh, sort of unfold into, into civil war. If you take the situation about farm attack, attacks and the intensity thereof, you know, if I talk about the escalation of crime, we look at the intensity as well as the geographical uh, growth of crime and where farm attacks have occurred in our country, uh, typical farm attack situation lasting from 6 to, to 12 hours uh, and it has brutal dimensions with major trauma ensuing from that, a, a gang of 15 well-armed uh, gangsters armed with AK-47 rifles, uh, one of them carrying a cell telephone block, blocking device on his, on his back. Uh, that operation being well reconnoitred and well planned beforehand and then happening and the criminals, the criminals then disappearing uh, through well-planned action into the underworld. If you if you look at that type of uh, manifestation of crime, it compares to guerrilla warfare. And one of the things that uh, is quite perturbing, worrying at this stage, uh, is the fact that uh, gangs are proliferating. They are increasing. Uh, we found that in uh, areas, excuse me, areas such as uh, uh, the, the the Sunshine Coast, uh, Port Alfred, uh, where gangs are quite young, and it's very difficult to to act uh, against them uh, because of their age. But uh, the threat of organised crime is 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 major in this country. But you know what what is important to my mind? Uh, we mustn't create fear. We must create hope. And we can only create hope once we start taking control over our own destiny. I found this, and I'm going to use an example of a planning session, which uh, I was involved in in, in Fogville one evening in a farm shed. And it was raining profusely. And we couldn't clearly hear what we were saying to each other and we started moving closer and closer to each other. So it was an, an extremely, fortunately, fortunately before COVID-19, an extremely intimate situation where we having discussions close to art with each other. And there was a, a lady uh, uh, who was part of this little team of the farmer community. Her name is uh, Nikki Simpson. And I believe that you can go and Google her. Um, more than she was, uh, I think, 71 years of age, alone on a farm in the Fortville area. Uh, she was attacked brutally by uh, a gang of uh, farm attackers for six hours. Uh, she will show you the signs where uh, they drilled through her knees and her feet and her hands with a Black & Decker drill. She was brutalized for six hours. It's just amazing to think of the experience that she went through and uh, the trauma, the trauma from us. But was what was interesting that was Nikki uh, said during this work session at some stage. She said, "Roland, I would like to just share something with the group." And she came and she stood next to me. I can still remember that I. Sort of, I knew she had uh, 
uh, she was under dire stress, and I sort of took just uh, took hold of her. I said, "Tell us your." Story. And she said, "No, you know what? Everybody knows my story, but what I'd like to share with you," she said, "after my incident on my farm, I went to to umpteen psychologists and uh, to I don't know how many counseling sessions, but for the first time, I have hope." And I said, explain to us. She said, yeah, I am with you in a group. And sort of intimacy is at the heart of competence. I'm with friends. We're talking about our situation, our current reality. But we are making plans. How we can contain our situation. And we are going to do this together. This is the best counseling that I've ever had. And what I found from our planning sessions, also the building of teams and the community that we are establishing is that through through planning you create hope because you learn how to take control over your own situation and we mustn't fear uh, to my mind faith is an important uh, feature with regards to this whole this whole process we must restore hope and uh, and trust uh, also in ourselves but in faith this is a this is a major playing game that we are in, and uh, I know there will come a political so solution at some stage. I know people are talking about establishing their own state and things like that, and working hard at creating a, a, a better political situation for this country. And we've got great people in this country, and I've got great hopes for this country. But I know that the political road is a very difficult road, and it's a there's, there's no short-term solution. It's a medium to long-term solution. What must we do in the meantime? As, as a people who are unthre under threat, uh, we must stand up, we must stand together, and we must uh, organize ourselves, and we must focus on keeping our people safe there where they are. And we must raise our hope and trust in faith. We don't have a question anymore. Uh, there's no other way. In the meantime, I believe that we will find a political sol solution along the way. Now, we, 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 it, it's interesting that we spoke about it a while ago. I mean, you know, there's, there's you know, the Cape exit and, and Cape independence movements, and we often joke, we say that should the Western Cape secede from South Africa, we should probably just secede the Southern Cape from the Western Cape. <laughs> and and uh, our, our own little republic of, of the Southern Cape. I mean, it's, it's, we truly live in a, a little bit of a, a piece of paradise. I mean, I, I speak to some of my colleagues and, and I hear and, and I listen and I think to myself, I think we're a little bit removed from from reality sometimes here in the in, in the garden route. But, but Roland, yeah. I, I, think I just want, I would just like to say I'm all for Cape Exit. And for yes. finding a better, a better uh, a political so solution. But at this stage, I'm working my backside off to help my people to empower themselves, to safeguard themselves. And in the meantime, I will, I will carry on. That is my main mission and my focus, uh, focus of main effort at this stage. Well, General Mengrobi discussed it at length. We, we realized that the only solution we have to become warlords or something like that should we succeed we are very pro medals and fake uniforms and ray bands <laughs> and gold teeth and <laughs> but yeah j jokes aside i think the show can go on for hours um and i think i suppose it's probably a good thing we didn't get to the bride tonight because i think the evening would have been a, a, quite a long evening but uh general from our side thank you very much um i know you're uh, we've been talking about it since i think october last year um when i yeah. found you for the first time and um we just kept on kicking the ball out um due to your schedule and then to ours um and but once again thank you very much um for, for granting us the privilege of having you on the show um i i do believe it is safe to say that there is more than enough content for a follow-up and there's i've got a list of stuff that we haven't even touched um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and please, and it, this this, te this technological barrier that we've experienced tonight, um, we need yeah. to 
we need to have a, a, a proper braai and uh, mm. um, uh, so we're getting fiber in April. Uh, yeah, Enrit is mentioning yes, that um, we're getting fiber. We're uh, getting fiber in April. It wasn't really great with yeah. all the the technical issues tonight, but yeah, the general. Thank you so much. Yeah, Rowan, I would just like to say, I. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Robbie, you're still talking. Okay. Uh, usually we would say is uh, zero, this is one zero uh, message over or message out. Um, I would just like to say, I'm not at my best sitting on this chair fixed in front of a TV screen. Um, I would rather have us talk informally around the campfire and uh, have an interactive session. I would prefer that. Uh, yeah. And there's a lot of information that one would like to share. It was a bit difficult with the communications coming and going. Um, it would have been good. I will Next time I will tell you uh, the story about Tony Pompey, who relayed for us in Angola. Uh, I mean, I was in Angola at one stage and I couldn't get a message through to one of my combat team commanders, and she came onto the net with a very clear voice, sitting about 20, 270 kilometers south of us uh, in Southwest Africa, and she re relayed perfect, perfectly uh, for us. So perhaps we must get Tani Pompey to join us. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away for the, for the next session. But I would like to say thank you, uh, Rowan and Krobi, uh, I know it's difficult to have discussions like this, uh, uh, and I would have loved it to be more informal, but uh, for all the listeners out there and uh, the important work uh, that we do together in terms of our emp empowering our people and to send out a positive message, that's extremely important for me. Uh, Nesbitt once said that uh, the mega trend of the future is networking. And I think, Rowan, you and Krobi, you are doing your utmost to create a network uh, which uh, really sends out a positive vibe to our people and the camaraderie that we experience in this way and, uh, and just uh, establishing new friendships and focusing on important issues are extremely important and that helps me and my team as well, you know, in terms terms of what we would like to do and what we would like to create. And I know time is always of the essence. It's one of our major problems. And then, of course, uh, fatigue. You can only do so much in, 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 in a span of time that you have avail available. So from my side, uh, Godspeed, you guys are doing a great job. Well, uh, General, I am 36. General Sagatman, my name is Roland. How old is you? I'm 36. And you, Grobby, you're smiling. Don't make up a story now. <laughs> Grobby, uh, I'm, 40, I'm, I'm 41. Okay, so uh, in that little little cluster, I'm looking at, looking at you, the senior. I just want to say that at 36, I commanded 6-1 MEC Battalion during Operation Protea. Uh, and uh, that's the age that you are now. So uh, you can uh, you can imagine that you are a combat team commander, combat group commander in command of more than 100 uh, combat vehicles with a thousand troops under command. And uh, that is a, a wonderful experience. And uh, it is uh, a great privilege to share our experiences with you guys because and I would like to say that uh, out forthrightly, and that is that you youngsters are facing a more difficult war that we faced during the uh, South African border war, which lasted for 23 years. So the challenge is yours now. You're the next generation, and you must arm yourself with knowledge and with the necessary networks so that we can uh, face the future with uh, great positivity so the best of luck to you guys out there 
General, th Roland, thank you very much for that. Um, we yes. were going to speak brief, brief, briefly offline once we're done. So I'm going to ask you to stay on just for, a, for another moment before we sign off. Guys, as usual, thank you very much for tuning in. I see some of the, the usual suspects commenting and, and, and tuning in and, and giving comments. Guys, thank you for all the support. for the uh, Weekend Warrior it is just over a year old now. Thank you very much just for the support. Everyday Carry South Africa, Morne, Gareth, Rob, you guys always supporting, always allowing us to share. Um, Ardebalo, Kimberf Concepts, thank you very much for your support. Previous guests on the show as well. Um, Paratus.info, Gideon Uber, guys, fantastic. Um, he does a huge job um, uh, for the firearms community in South Africa. Uh, please like and follow his page. And uh, please like and support their project with Dear South Africa to get the firearms legislation changed in South Africa. And um, so all of those guys always sharing, commenting, helping us build the brand. And then, of course, none, not, not but last but not least, Ramon Kabanak, uh, the guys from the Renegade Report, Renegade Media for, for making this possible for us. Guys, thank you. Roland, thanks to you. And uh, guys, we are signing off and we will catch you guys soon. We've got some guests lined up. Have a glorious evening. Thank you very much. Thank Here you. Now, I'm gonna Thank you, you so online. much. Thank you.